Science and Human Origins, Objections, Part 3. We've been discussing the book Science and Human Origins uh, by Ann Gauger, Douglas Axe, and Casey Luskin. And uh, uh, there are several chapters. We discussed chapters 1 and chapter 2 about two weeks ago. And we started on chapter 3, um, but there's a lot of material here, and it, it can be confusing. And uh, we didn't have all the information we needed last week. So we're continuing on chapter three. Next week, we hope to get to chapter four. And uh, or actually, the week after, after a week interlude with uh, Danila Boscovich. And uh, uh, then the week after, we hope to get the, uh, to chapter five, which is one of the more interesting chapters, although not the centerpiece of the book as the critics would like you to believe. <clears throat> the book itself is available on the web, and uh, the critics have supposedly debunked the book, um, at least according to Rational Wiki. Uh, seems to be the only debunking they mention. And uh, the objections to chapter one come in two different places, one in the standard part where he's doing it, and also um, in another place where he addresses one of the specific complaints. Um, chapters two, three, four, and five, again, chapter four has two, uh, two parts to the uh, review. Um, and uh, I got this critique from uh, uh, Jeffrey Sonnentag, who uh, got it from somebody by the name of Igakusi. And uh, again, you notice a little snark that Igakusi gives some actual evolutionary biologists also go through the book. And of course, their treatment of it is not as favorable as the treatment I gave. But I submit that that has more to do with uh, philosophical bias than it does with actual uh, content criticism, but we will see. Um, was the critique cherry-picked? Well, if so, it was by Igakusi. And uh, again, to draw you back to a rational wiki, uh, the reception of the book, it is an anti-science book and has received negative reviews from scientists for pushing a religious agenda, or at least that's what they say. The sole purpose of the book was an attempt to try and prove Adam and Eve existed. Uh, that's frankly baloney. Um, and um, um, the Adam and Eve is explicitly mentioned as an add-on, not the main purpose of the book. The main purpose of the book is in chapters one and two, and the critics fail miserably at critiquing that part. I don't even think they understand what the what their um, what the point of the book was. But in any case, it is claimed that the book has been debunked chapter by chapter in a lengthy online review by Auckland University T of Technology PhD candidate McBride. Notice that on their side, candidates are okay. On our side, if you don't have a full-fledged PhD, and if it isn't in biology, you don't count. But we do happen to have a PhD actually in biology in our class. So <laughs> we <laughs> will be awaiting comments. Um, but uh, notice that the next time they tell you you can't listen to somebody who doesn't have a PhD. Um, chapter three objections, we're gonna review very briefly one of the comments that he makes Luskin must be something of a polymath. Well, in fact, he is a little bit of one. Um, he did take graduate work in biology, and then he took graduate work in law. So, you know, he's a pretty smart cookie. Uh, Luskin is right to point out that the hominin fossil record isn't perfect, and that at times the completeness of that record has been overstated. Oh, their side has actually been misleading people. Perhaps not intentionally, but certainly has been doing it. But he goes further and channels Luantin to make a strange claim. 
Um, I assume that Luantin is also strange, who is an actual evolutionary biologist with a PhD, I think. Um, uh, so fragmentary and disconnected is the data that in the judgment of Harvard zoologist Richard Lewontin, no fossil hominid species can be established as their direct ancestor. All that stuff you hear about, it went from here to here to here to here. They don't know. They really don't know. For the most part, Luskin does a fine job of pointing out all of the scientific controversy around different fossils. Oh, uncertainties of placement, the effective placement of one fossil and placement of the others and so forth. He doesn't spend a lot of time balancing this with broad agreement f formed in literature on the fossils preferring to emphasize descent. Well, and then he goes on to say teaching the controversies should first require teaching the orthodoxy. But of course he does teach the orthodoxy and one of the problems is that the orthodoxy, there are at least two or three different orthodoxies out there and uh, waving the one to say, well, uh, this one's orthodoxy and that one's not, doesn't really help you. Which orthodoxy do they want him to teach? But he does go through it anyway. And then his comments about Australopithecines beyond this, there would be a thousand people better qualified than I to comment on the Australopithecines further and I will leave it to them to do so. So he's not really going to touch the Australopithecines at all. Which means, I think, that Luskin made his point on the apes. Now, we're going to switch over to another one of those commentaries. It's not the one that was referred to, uh, but it is a related one from somebody who labels himself as Afarensis. And if you're wondering where that reference came from, uh, Afarensis is, of course, the, the species name of Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy. This guy is claimed, I guess, to be a direct descendant of Lucy. That's what, it, what that means. And um, in a blog, and, and I'm not going to quote the whole blog, I'm just going to quote the really important part, and I think this is one we should take to heart because I think this is one that Luskin messed up on and will go through the evidence. Luskin Science and Origin and Dick Dick Feces, and there's a reference to that uh, for those of you who are looking at it on the internet and uh, want to stop and copy the uh, address. Then Luskin moves to Lucy and seems to be under the impression that Lucy is the only specimen of Australopithecus afarensis available to us. Along the way, he recapitulates material I've looked at previously here. He does add something new, which turns out to be a pretty good example of the intellectual dishonesty Luskin is known for. Um, here's where the Dick Dick feces hits the fans. From Luskin, there are some reasons for skepticism over whether the bones of Lucy represent a single individual or even a single species. In a video playing at the exhibit, Lucy's discoverer Donald Johansson this is an exhibit that made a tour of the United States. Um, admitted that when he found the fossil, the bones were scattered across a hillside where he looked up the slope and there were other bones sticking out. Johansson's written account explains further how the bones were not found together. Now that's probably true of Lucy herself, the first part. Um, because they weren't found all collected into one nice little uh, 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 specimen. There were other bones, uh, I mean, pardon me, they were, they were, not, they were not in the position of death. Um, but then he quotes, unfortunately, um, since the fossil wasn't found in situ, it could have come from anywhere above. There's no matrix on any of the bones we found either. All you can do is make some probability statements. Um, and um, Afarensis' comments were, sounds like Johansson is talking about Lucy at Hadar and is admitting that they just guessed where AL288-1 came from, right? Wrong. 
The 66 in the quote above is Luskin's footnote, which goes to Tim White, quoted in Donald Johansson and James Shreve, Lucy's Child, the Discovery of a Human Ancestor. Page 163. So it's not Johansson talking about Lucy at Hadar, even though Luskin made it sound like it was. It's Tim White talking about Lucy at Hadar, right? Wrong. If you go to page 163 of Lucy's Child, The Discovery of a Human Ancestor, you'll find out that it is Tim White talking about OH262 at Aldivai Gorge. The night previous to White's statement, Johansson White and Suwa had found the first few fragments of OH62. The next day they returned to the area, which was also known as a dick, dick latrine. Little animals poop in the same place for some reason, possibly marking territory. Uh, with the flocks of scientists, students, and guests to begin a proper examination and excavation of the site. White is quizzing a couple of grad students on how to proceed when he makes that s comment. So rather than being a statement of ignorance about Lucy on the part of Johansson, it is just Luskin making stuff up in a, I'm assuming that should be in instead of it, a blatant display of dishonest scholarship. Well, <coughs> mm, You go to page 163, and what you find is that the creature in question is not identified there. You have to read virtually the whole book before you figure out which creature they are talking about, although if you read before, considerably before, you'll find out that they were, they were in fact in Old Divai Gorge, and that Let's just look at the, at the context of, uh, of the statement. That's basalt there down the road, Berhane said, so here we must be pretty near the bottom of bed one. Right, said Tim, and since the fossil wasn't found in C2, it could have come from anywhere above. There's no matrix on the bones. This is the statement that's being quoted. Um, and then the bones are in pretty good shape, so chances are they haven't traveled very far, Jane offered. Um, good thinking. Also consider how fragile a maxilla is compared to other cranial parts. If that piece of jaw had rolled a long way to where Berhane found it, there wouldn't, be any, there wouldn't be that much left of it. So we can hope that it weathered out of the real soft stuff underneath this protective lag. So they're discussing some fossil, and it's not clear which one. And I don't know exactly how Luskin got to the conclusion he did. Maybe he heard Johansson on the video talking about stuff scattered around, and then just assume that, that this was another example of the same thing. Uh, maybe somebody else had made the mistake before him. I can tell you this much, I had scanned Lubinow as closely as I could, um, both uh, the older and the younger edition, and Lubinow does not make that mistake. Still, if you, it is not Lucy, and if you read all the way to page 283, you will get exactly what it's talking about. OH62, or the Dick Dick Hill hominid, uh, or what's known in the title as Lucy's Child. Now, if you're wondering about what in the world is Lucy's Child, well, it was the thing that resurrected Donald Johansson's career, because he had found Lucy and not found anything else for a long time. And now he found this creature, and it's supposed to be Homo habilis. That's the one that's in the disputed category. Interestingly enough, what he found was little pieces of cranium and uh, face, and that don't really completely fit together. They, you have to kind of imagine where they ought to go. So um, I suppose you can get some kind of an idea of how, what, what kind of brain size, but you're really dependent on, on best estimates of, of the rounding effect. And it is a small brain creature, if their reconstruction is correct. And then they found a long humerus, a short femur, and in fact their ratio is a little bit longer to shorter than what Lucy was. So in other words, it looked more ape-like. They don't have the elbow, they don't have the knee, they don't have 
the kinds of things that would enable you in the hip joint to enable you to say whether this creature walked upright or not. Um, but it certainly looked like an ape. Um, of, of interest, if you read through this whole thing, you find out that Johansson's research was funded by the Koch brothers. Uh, those are the people whom people are always, uh, certain people on the left are always criticizing for being uh, 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 oh, interested in uh, right-wing politics, I guess. But uh, just kind of interesting. And again, the, Lucy's child is, in fact, homo habilis. It's more ape-like than Lucy. Uh, and I have to say, Luskin blew this one. I, somehow, he misunderstood which fossil was being looked for. Uh, I, I don't know, did he trust some source that he thought was trustworthy and got misled, or did, did he just uh, um, assume because of what he had heard about from Johansson to begin with that, um, that this is, in fact, uh, Lucy's description? The description of the, of the discovery of Lucy, in fact, is found in pages 85 to 88 of Lucy's Child by Johnson and Shreve. Shreve is up. Uh, uh, a journalist, a uh, science journalist, I guess you could say. So he kind of, I think, helped uh, Johansson in stylistic ways and polish it up and stuff. Um, and then also, interestingly, later the first family, which is disputed as to whether it's Homo bilis or whether it is um, uh, Australopithecus afarensis and um, as and a whole interesting argument that you'd have to read the book to understand what the arguments were. And I don't think anybody has enough information to be able to completely close it down. And uh, so this is Johansson's description of actually finding Lucy in, in the book Lucy's Child. But just as I turned to leave, I saw what appeared to be a fragment of an elbow joint lying at the bottom of the slope above. Tom and I knelt down to examine the thing. It was small, very small, but unquestionably a hominid. Then he spotted a piece of skull next to Tom's hand. And suddenly we seemed to be surrounded by hominid bones. A femur, a piece of fel pelvis, ribs, some vertebrae. For a while we just groped around from one bone to the next, too stunned to speak. It occurred to me right away that perhaps all these bones might belong to a single individual. But I was afraid to speak that thought out loud as if by doing so I would break the spell and we would once again find ourselves standing in an unremarkable, boneless little gully in the middle of nowhere. Tom, on the other hand, could not hold in his excitement. He let out a yell, and then I heard myself yelling too, and we were hugging each other and dancing up and down in the heat. They were just getting ready to quit for midday when they found it. As we brought the fragments of our skeleton back to camp over the next few weeks, so apparently it took them several weeks to actually find all the pieces, uh, we laid them out as they would have been in life, a vertebra in line, rib fragments branching out in parallel arcs, the top of the thigh bone firmly nestled into, in its pelvic socket. The effect was uncanny. We all shared the feeling that this ancient creature was being recreated, coming to life before our eyes. I knew as well that as Lucy emerged, my own life was irrevocably changing. Whatever she turned out to be, Lucy was sure to be one of the biggest finds of the century. To point to another skeleton in anywhere near the same state of preservation. To point to any another skeleton in anywhere near the same state of preservation, 40% there, 60% missing. One would have to advance in time all the way to the Neanderthal fossils from the Middle Paleolithic period in Europe, 75,000 years ago. This one was easily 40 times as old. If I had made a significant find with the knee joint the year before, with Lucy, I had made a reputation. Notice something else that um, these people, once they get into it, have a personal interest in what happens to their bones. And of course, Johansson would like to believe that uh, Lucy was one of our ancestors because he found her. And that makes him the finder of our ancestors. Now, there's one other thing that I found that was interesting when reading the book. 
Johansson and Richard Leakey are meeting in a televised, for a televised discussion of ancient man. Apparently, Walter Cronkite wanted to create a controversy on film. Um, at least that's Johansson's belief. Um, and I'll start reading part of the, uh, again, this is just taking the important snippet out. Several paleontologists from the museum were also gathered around. Richard guided me behind a partition. Don, I hope this doesn't turn into a debate, he confided. Our differences are really of a minor nature, and it would just confuse the public if we started going on about Jaws. There's a terrible threat of creationist in this country, creationism in this country, and we should show a united front. By the way, the only place in the book where creationism is mentioned, as far as I know. And then uh, Don Johansson says, I don't agree that our differences are minor, but I don't know what's going to happen, I said. I suppose it's up to Cronkite. And then they describe the, uh, uh, the filming session, which did, in fact, turn into somewhat of a debate. Um, but let's not debate because creationists might get the wrong idea. That's a kind of an interesting thought. Now, maybe, uh, maybe Johansson is sliming Richard? I don't know. But I found it kind of interesting uh, that at least somebody thought that uh, creationists were worth worrying about and were worth uh, kind of burying the hatchet over disputes because people might otherwise get the wrong idea. Now, to go back to the objections of uh, McBride. Even though Luskin complains of a poor hominin fossil record, and of course there are stretches where it is poor, uh, okay, there are multiple Homo erectus fossils and substantial evidence of greatly increasing cranial capacity over time. In fact, this is a key part of why some workers split some of the later Homo erectus specimens into a different species, Homo heidelbergensis. Whether we accept this or whether we prefer to lump them as one species, it is clear that there is important variation to cranial capacity from early to late Homo erectus. Early Homo erectus have considerably smaller cranial volumes than those dated to the last couple hundred thousand years. They're getting bigger, slowly. The average cranial volume of early Georgian Homo erectus, dating to about 1.7 million years, is 700 cc's. Uh, see Anton 2003. And I went to Anton 2003, and sure enough, they do mention that uh, um, I think the smallest was 670, and the largest was 760. And, it, and she did say, this is Susan Anton, um, that it was 700 cc's was the average. Luskin's source doesn't even acknowledge such small sizes, giving the lower bounds for Homo erectus as 850 cc's. Now, it's interesting because Luskin didn't say that he had a source, but obviously the person who wrote this, Paul McBride, had a pretty good idea that Luskin did have a source. Um, and the Luskin wasn't just talking out of thin air. Um, they're also short, the Georgian... Homo erectus. They're about 148 centimeters, which, if I, my calculations are correct, works out to be about 410. And that's shorter than most of the Homo erectus that you'll see. Of interest, there are Homo erectus uh, floriensis, or Homo floriensis, depending on whose uh, 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 taxonomic categories you're using, um, that have uh, brain size of about 350, 400 cc's, um, and the island of Flores. Um, and interestingly, those creatures are also very short. They're even shorter than uh, the Georgian Homo erectus, and they have tool-making abilities. Um, so apparently, the size of the cranium doesn't mean quite as much. Uh, certainly the little people of Flores were uh, sometimes known as hobbits. 
uh, were much much shorter but uh, and much smaller cranial capacity, but it does, uh, they seem to have been able to have plenty of intellectual capacity, which is the important thing. Um, and then the update that we showed last week again, um, a paper in this issue by Schultz, Nelson, and Dunmar elegantly summarizes hominin cognitive evolution. Now I want you to notice the confusion that's being written here. Summarizes cognitive hominin cognitive evolution showing a series of progressive and punctuated changes that culminate, uh, culminate in the emergence of modern human language within the last 100,000 years. How in the world from a bone do you tell whether the creature can speak? No, what it shows is brain size. Brain size evolution of more than three million years is summarized. That's how they know about the cognitive evolution of brain size. It's not has nothing to do with whether the creatures could or could not speak or could use tools or any of that kind of stuff. And this is the drawing that they give. Well, actually, and that's the figure one from Schultz, Nelson, and Dunbar. I cordially invite Casey Luskin to readdress the issue of human evolution in this context. Um, which is very nice of him. And uh, there's a second update. Uh, Richard Hopp has kindly pointed me several posts by Nick Matsky addressing hominin cranial evolution. So we're going to look at one of those, actually two of those. Um, also demonstrating lack of discontinuity that Luskin has claimed. And I'll let you decide when you see what uh, Matsky has put up. The breathtaking thing is Maskey's post here and here, which of course are links that they have, deals specifically with Luskin's claims back in 2006. As well as raw cranial capacity shows that temporal progression is a proportion of body mass. Yet six years later, I'm sure that's later, Luskin's arguments remain firm in the face of the evidence. He is still arguing in 2012 that there is a massive gap in the hominin re fossil record that modern humans arrived with the effectively modern brain capacity as Homo erectus. Well, let's, uh, now, uh, Hopp would also like an explanation from Luskin of his omission of Hindenburg and de Miguel, who conclude that there are no discontinuities through time or geographic latitude in hominin cranial evolution. Um, Luskin's making his case. He's not making their case for them. It's fine for them to quote that, but Luskin says there are people who say, and he just doesn't name all the papers. Why should he? Well, maybe he should if you're doing a complete, but then you don't have a short to the point uh, chapter. Then you have a book that's so thick nobody will read it. Um, which is, of course, maybe what they want is that nobody will read it. Well, here's the Maskey data. First of all, I'll tell you where I got it. There are two sites, and you'll notice that um, uh, they differ, I think, by um, number more. And it looks like that's all, except that this is a period here. No, uh, no that, well, this is one. Okay, so there's a one in there that's different from the two. but. Anyway, so you can look at them yourself. Here's the first one. And if you look at this, it looks pretty impressive, right? Here is just simply a, an attempt by somebody else, namely D. Miguel and Hindenburg, 2001, to give a comprehensive listing of all the skulls, their age, their species, and their, um, and their cranial capacity. And if you look at this, it looks, you know, you could argue that that's a pretty decent curve. Now, of course, it's interesting that all these lived at 2.5 precisely million years, whereas you'd expect there to be 2.4, 2.3. I think that's an artifact of how these things are collected and, and dated rather than uh, an actual uh, uh, time clustering. But, um, but here's what's interesting. 
Now, they're going to color all the Australopithecus red. They're going to color the Homo habilis orange, the early Homo, and the Homo. An early Homo, I assume, is going to turn out to be Homo habilis, but maybe not. And then the Homo erectus is green, the Neanderthal and the Homo sapiens are blue, and the archaic Homo sapiens are also blue. There's some that go back to almost a million years. Uh, it's very interesting that you can almost draw a line between these. They tend to cluster. Now, yeah, there's some overlap right here. But it's fascinating that they're that way. He did it again. Um, and uh, this time, he called Habilis, Australopithecus Habilis, and turned it orange. But I think you see the same effect. The only real question is, this early Homo, is any of that Homo erectus? Now, if you could establish that that was Homo erectus, then I think you'd have a better argument for there being a nice gradual um, change. But it looks like there's a pretty, pretty significant jump when you get to Homo erectus. Now, for what it's worth, if you look down here at the bottom of this one, this is, um, it, on all four it has the same disclaimer, a uh, chart by Nick Matsky of NCSE, free to use for nonprofit educational use with acknowledgement, so I'm acknowledging it. And this is nonprofit and educational. We haven't even taken up an offering here, so. Uh, <coughs> but uh, now they're, what they're doing is they're putting all of the disputed ones, but again, unless you can establish that the disputed ones are in fact between Homo habilis and Homo erectus, uh, and that some of the Homo erectus belong down here, you've got a pretty clear uh, division point. Now, would I put too much weight on that? No, frankly. Um, the blues are modern man. Yeah, this volume is cool, but yeah, but there are actually modern humans that have reasonably normal intelligence that have 800 cc's. So, you know, uh, I mean, one of the things that you have to keep in mind is that uh, pituitary dwarfism will give you a small head too, uh, but a normal head uh, in terms of intelligence. Now, to go on with Afrensis, um, no, to go on with McBride. In addition, if the hominin, of, hominin fossil record is so definitively prob problematic, there should be a testable alternative framework by which we can interpret what we find. And what is this alternative? Luskin does not propose one. I can only imagine we are meant to tacitly know. The graceful hand of the intelligent designer was involved in our special creation, and the rest is mere detail. This is the thing that frustrates them all. The book is very carefully written without any reference to whether there was an intelligent designer called God. It just, if it discusses intelligent design at all, it discusses it in the generic. And the reason why is precisely because what these guys want to do is turn this into a science versus religion fight where the scientists are the religious people. And we're objective. And they have their book, and they believe every, every bit of it. That's what they're trying to do. And if they can turn it into that, they can make some pretty good propaganda. And one of the things that frustrates them 
is that we're simply saying, well, does evolution have enough power to explain the data on its own without support from, well, but there's nobody else that could do it. Now, Luskin made a reply, and I'll just go over some of the highlights of that. McBride writes, Luskin, in fact, appears to reject that, uh, the reply, the website is there. Um, Luskin, in fact, appears to reject that Homo habilis belongs in Homo, referring to habiline specimens separately from true members of Homo. McBride correctly describes my view, but he writes as if I invented this position arbitrarily to suit my wishes. That's hardly the case. And remember, Luskin is not going to stick his neck out on his own authority making this, not without doing years to study it. Um, as this position is held by a number of other scientists. In that regard, McBride makes no mention of the strong authorities I cited in Science and Human Origins which support this view. And remember, they're supporting this view kind of a little bit against their own interests. Were it not for these papers and these authorities, I would never hold this position. Thus, my chapter three cites a major review article in the journal Science by leading paleoanthropologist Bernard Wood and Mark Collins and uh, Oh my. Uh, ignore that last little bit that was gotten onto it by some kind of computer glitch. Um, and um, I caught it after about one or two tries. Now let's see if. Um, Well, I'm going to go on beyond that because I had a, um, a uh, shot of this and I, if I, uh, I'll show it to you in a little bit, a slide that got dropped or maybe didn't get in. Um, one dimensional thinking, the pitfalls of using regression lines. So he criticizes uh, just saying, since there is a regression line, there, there must be a gradual evolution. And then um, he says, it, uh, Intermediate size skulls is not the major issue. And I uh, wish I'd shown you the other part of it because that's uh, important. I will show the, that in a minute. So yes, there are a lot of skulls of different sizes. Some might call many of them intermediate. In fact, according to some leading paleoanthropologists, this is the only trait for which there are intermediate examples in the hominin fossil record. As seen in table one above, which is, we'll come back to that. Wood and Collard's review looked at six traits, and you can score brain size as the one trait for which they find fossils with intermediate characters. So instead of the score being six to nothing against Darwinian evolution, I suppose the score is now only five to one. This is nothing new, and I fully acknowledged it in my paper. And then he says, read your citations carefully. As we saw, Nick Matsky got excited over Henningberg and De Miguel because it claimed all hominids appeared to be uh, to very single, gradually evolving lineage with respect to cranial capacity. This citation is also Im very important to McBride, but in an update at the end of his review of my chapter three, he brandishes a new paper in Philosophical um, Transactions of the Royal Society B, the aforementioned paper by Schultz et al. in 2012. And he says it's ironic that McBride positive, he cites Schultz et al. 2012, because McBride would seemingly disagree with the paper. McBride maintains there is a, quote, lack of discontinuity, end quote, in the fossil record according to hominin cranial capacity. But Schultz et al. in 2012 finds evidence for, quote, punctuational changes, end quote, saltation, quote, end quote, and, quote, rapid change in hominin brain size, end quote. The paper finds there was an abrupt increase in brain size in hominis, hominins corresponding to the origin of the genus Homo. And that's specifically, we're talking about Homo um, erectus. This supports my thesis, not McBride's. Reading the rest of the paper, we find that there are periods of, quote, rapid change in hominin brain size, end quote, one of which corresponds to the appearance of the genus Homo. The paper states, Quote, the first two steps, change 
step changes coincide with the appearance of early homo, end quote. And then offers his, this thesis statement at the beginning of the discussion section. So this is their thesis at the beginning of the discussion section. We reevaluated patter patterns of hominin brain size change and dis demonstrate that rather than being a monotonic increase, that is, step by step, hominin brain size increase is dominated by step changes with limited evidence for long-term gradual increases. That's the paper that they were quoting to him. I, I appreciate that McBride is checking my sources. That's that great. I think that should be that's great if he found a source saying that there are erectus skulls that are a mere 150 cc smaller than the smallest erectus skull I was aware of. I was just citing the sizes I found in my source. And this is why the, uh, McBride criticized Luskin's source rather than Luskin himself, because he knows where the source is. An authoritative textbook on human variation by Washington University of St. Louis anthropologist Stephen Molnar, Human Variations, Races, Types, and eth Ethnic Groups. If McBride found a skull size that was slightly smaller, that wouldn't surprise me a bit, since I also cited a credible scientific paper saying that modern humans can have cranial capacities as small as 800 cc's lower than the smallest size I found for Homo, homo erectus. And then he has a section on intelligent Homo erectus, which is quite fascinating. Apparently, some Homo erectus have been found on islands, which necessitates that they had to be able to build boats, which takes a certain amount of intelligence, certainly more than most chimpanzees ex exhibit. In fact, more than all chimpanzees exhibit that I know of. Um, and it's quite fascinating to read. And they're apparently able to produce all kinds of artifacts that chimpanzees don't. And then the first paragraph of the conclusion, I won't read the whole conclusion, but this, this is in Luskin's reply. This has been a long article, but I hope it is instructive in showing how evolutionists deal with the fossil hominin evidence. As we've seen, multiple authorities recognize that our genus Homo appears in the fossil record abruptly with a complex suite of characteristics never before seen in any hominin. And that suite of characteristics has remained remarkably constant from the time Homo appeared until the present day with you, me, and the rest of modern humanity. The one possible exception to this is brain size where there are some skulls of intermediate cranial capacity, and there is some increase over time. But even there, when Homo appears, it does so with an abrupt increase in skull size. And the earliest forms of Homo, Homo erectus, has an average skull size and even a range of skull sizes that are essentially within the range of modern human genetic variation. Citing smaller skull sizes doesn't change the fact that skull size is, is of uncertain importance for determining intelligence. And certainly, if you consider artifacts, that's important. Now, I'm going to give you my take. Actually, I'm going to exit, if I can, and see if I can find um, Let's see. Get this out of the way. I think it's the last screenshot, but let me make sure. No, it's not that one. Um, unfortunately, the, when this goes to the small screen, it messes up everything. Let's see if I can. I think this may be it. We'll see. Yes, it is. Okay. So this is the table that uh, didn't get into the. Uh, uh, presentation, but here's, here's what it looks like. This is a reconstruction of Table 7 from Wood and, and Collard, and you'll notice that once you get to Homo ergaster, erectus, heidelbergensis, and neanderthalensis, they all have fundamentally human characteristics except for ergaster brain size seems to be very small, and erectus brain size seems to be intermediate. But you'll notice that the development is all human. The jaws and teeth, the locomotion, the body shape, 
the body size are all human, whereas Rudolfensis is Australopithecine, Habilis is Australopithecine, and those are the division lines that they're making. So that, yeah, you can argue about brain size, but the other five, there does seem to be a clear division between Homo habilis and, uh, in fact, uh, Ergaster. And certainly between Homo habilis and Homo erectus. Which is why some people argue that Homo habilis is really an ape and should be called one. Okay, and now if we can go back to there. In my opinion, Luskin made a mistake regarding the bones of Lufsi. I don't know if he followed somebody or not, but it's a mistake and we should say that up front. If you're going to use it, this is one problem that you'll have in the book, is that, uh, is that on that particular issue, there's a misunderstanding and it should be clarified. I hope if they do another book, they take that out or maybe even make a note as to what it really was. Lucy's, well, well, they were found in one area, I would say, not, not necessarily one spot. Uh, but they weren't found with somebody saying, well, they could have come from anywhere. That quote was, uh, was poor context. It's a quote uh, uh, that comes from page 163 of the book, but in fact it refers to Lucy's child, not Lucy. Luskin, I think, took a textbook as authoritative for Homo erectus brain size, and not surprisingly, that's what most of us would do. Uh, one has to be careful with textbooks, and especially in a controversial area. Um, it may even be worthwhile if he revises it to mention the Homo erectus in Georgia and deal with them in some way. Um, I think Luskin is mostly right regarding Homo erectus. And I think his critics don't deal with most of the evidence. They do deal with one piece. That's a brain size. But the rest of it they don't really deal with. And uh, at that I will uh, invite comments or questions. Here, let me pass that back. Um, okay, yeah, so for uh, our PhD in biology, who has authority in these areas, <laughs> uh, just one. Uh, forget about all that. Uh, one uh, interesting comment uh, or <clears throat> fact, actually, that I think tells us a little bit the subjectivity of uh, taxonomy. In the 1970s, I. Uh, Louis Leakey, uh, the icon, I might say, uh, at that time of um, uh, physical anthropology, uh, put out an article where he was proposing that uh, Homo habilis uh, should be in the Homo group. And in that article, uh, the, the normal bottom line for man's cranial capacity was 700, 750, and Homo habilis was 600. And uh, he said, well, uh, we ought to reconsider and redefine the genus Homo. Uh, th this is allowing the uh, theory to redefine uh, nature. And so we need to keep in mind that uh, this whole Homo habilis and the definition of where Homo starts uh, was done by uh, one who was, you know, trying to propose uh, uh, the evolution of man per se, uh, not based so much on the uh, data itself as based on the theory. And uh, I think we need to keep this in mind. I, Homo habilis, I, I think, is is an Australopithecine and sh should be reclassified in that area, and some anthropologists and brothers say, hey, no, yeah, it, it, it is not homo, so keep that in mind that this is uh, 
a very subjective argument, and it's uh, uh, one that uh, I think should, should not overwhelm us at all. That, that, uh, if you redefine that, of course, the textbooks won't look as good, and uh, the sequence won't look as good, uh, uh, but uh, uh, the, the basis for it was just a purely subjective, I think, uh, uh, wanting to fit. Homo habilis into the homo genus. Well, I think the thing that bothers me the most about that is <coughs> it isn't just the small size of the brain. Uh, Lucy's child, supposedly one of the early homo habilis, <coughs> has got long arms, has got short legs. Uh, it looks like an ape. It's got a brain the size of an ape. Why are we not calling it an ape? Because it later turned into a human? Uh, what happened with like describing what you see? There are very few samples, for one thing. And uh, apparently uh, they have a mixed origin and something. Yeah, it's, it's a kind of a grab bag or bargain <laughs> garbage bag actually yeah. now to be uh, fair to them <clears throat> this is the way they view it that these creatures gradually and the fact of the matter is that you can't draw a line between any of them in their book that uh, that that the line sort of gradually got, if you draw a line there are people that are specimens on one side of the line, specimens on the other side of the line, specimens right on the line. Any line you draw is arbitrary. And so therefore, if you're going to draw it at 600 cc's or at 800 cc's, who's to say? And, and that, that also means that that's one of the reasons I don't put that much weight on the fact that all those green things seem to be above the line and all the red and orange things seem to be below it, is because if if you draw the line on the basis of the size of the brain, well, of course the green ones are all going to be above it and the red ones are all going to be below it because that's how you drew the line. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure that it proves much in any case. But aren't you making the point that if there is gravity, you can Yeah. Well, the thing of it is I don't think you can prove either way by the... You know, we're reading tea leaves. Uh, there's just so very little. Now, we had a comment above, and then I'll come back to you. Uh, but he and then we'll give it back to you as soon as he gets done. Um, just a quick question. When Luskin is recounting that uh, show that he went to, and he heard uh, Johansson actually speaking, is there no transcript of that? Because it seems to me like as he, he had seen the tr or heard uh, the guy speaking on whatever video, whatever it might have been in those days, and then went to look for a written verification of that. And that's why he slipped into not reading the whole book to decide who it was that was being spoken of. I it think you may very well be right. Okay. The other thing is uh, I, w I spent a couple of years in Ethiopia, and I had a, an old man he was in his late 70s still working because there's no pension programs there. And he kept saying, we must go, we must go. Well, we, we never had a vehicle good enough to go into the Afar region. But he was saying that he had been there as a young man. And he said it was a very large area where um, the bones had been discovered. Not, you know, you, you, when you read the books, you see a little picture with a kind of a photo and a line showing you where they came out. And his comment was that the area was even bigger. His other comment was that there were more than one type of animal in the bones that were collected. Now, I don't know if you have any comment or whether there's anybody who's verified that, have any, um, I don't know if they do DNA on those, probably not, but I mean, is there any kind of really good laboratory work being done to say that this 40% of the bones that supposedly make up Lucy, that they are all from the same animal? Uh, there's a big dispute over that, uh, but it's more light than heat. The big defense that's made is that we don't have any duplicate bones. Um, it's an okay defense, I guess. Um, 
And if you can make the case that all the bones were found in this uh, area and we didn't throw out any because they're duplicates, then I think you can, make a, you can make a good case for that. I agree with you. I think that what happened was that he heard this. He was really impressed by, I mean, it was all over the hillside. It wasn't like found as a skeleton. With coordinated joints and all that? Yeah, and apparently not. In fact, if you look at Lucy, you will see that I think there's a hip and the femur that actually fit together in terms of a joint. After that, you have to hunt really hard to find joints. That there's pieces of ribs, <coughs> that there's pieces of you know, vertebrae, uh, uh, that there's pieces of stuff that's been stuck together, sometimes uh, I think reasonably so. Uh, but that you don't have a shoulder joint, you don't have an elbow joint, that you actually don't have most of the joints that have been broken off or worn off or whatever happened to them. The other thing that even intrigued me then, and that's why we wanted to go there with a pick and a s shovel, is that apparently they're still digging, but not much is being found. Now, how likely is it that an ind one individual of any species would be in an area all by themselves? I mean, that, that seems to me, uh, you know, something un very unusual. I'm not saying that it wasn't found there, because, I mean, these guys were all verifying that their dads were working there, and, yeah, they found this, and it was very exciting, and that they're still trying to dig, but not much has been discovered since. Well, so one of the things you don't hear much about, um, but if you read Hansen's book, you'll find out, is that not only did they find Lucy, but shortly thereafter, I want to say the next day, but uh, my memory may be a little foggy on that particular um, uh, point, but certainly shortly thereafter they found a whole bunch of other bones, uh, so much so that they called them the first family. And at first those were classified as homo and Lucy was classified as Australopithecus. And then after a long discussion with him and Tim White being on the advocacy side, particularly Tim White, who happens to be a lumper rather than a splitter, they argued that everything was a, uh, Australopithecus afarensis and that the variations in the bones, which would at first look like clearly different species, are just variations in one species. Now, did they actually make the case? I don't know. It'd be interesting to see whether everybody else uh, agrees that there's only one Australopithecus afarensis. Uh, because if not, then it implies that maybe some early homo went back quite a ways. And I do know that there are some bones in one particular elbow that's mentioned by Mar uh, Marvin Lubinow, uh that's somewhere in the neighborhood of four million years old by the standard <coughs> chronologies, uh, that looks in every way human except that it's early, and so it's been labeled Australopithecine because there weren't humans around then. There had to be only Australopithecine, so it must have been an Australopithecus. But in fact, it looks like modern human. Now, you know, what do you do with that kind of stuff? Uh, yes, and then... Yes, uh, I would uh, suggest that the use of uh, fossils as an argument to determine the level of human intelligence and its evolution over time is uh, Risky al almost, best. almost obviously self-defeating. Uh, all you have to do to defeat it or refute it is to consider modern humans and sexual dimorphism. Women on the average are about 200 cubic centimeters smaller in brains than men are. And they're obviously and that less intelligent. Th pardon? <laughs> <laughs> and that used, Oops. <laughs> that used to be offered as an argument why women were inferior in intelligence, of oh, course, geez. when patriarchy had its heyday. But uh, that's been thoroughly discredited and refuted. And the fossil record itself is so spotty, the sewell Wright effect points out that small populations rarely produce fossils because the conditions for fossilization are so complex. 
and you have all kinds of gaps virtually for every species. And I think if you want to determine the, an evolution or progression of human intelligence, you have to look not to fossils but to artifacts. The best evidence of increasing intelligence is uh, the quality and the complexity of artifacts that humans produce. We're the only species that's capable of producing civilization. And the real gap occurs not millions of years ago. The real gap seems to occur uh, somewhere between 50,000 BC and 35,000 BC when Cro-Magnon man emerges uh, as early as 200,000 BC according to anthropologists you have Homo sapiens emerging and Swanscombe man and Steinem man and Verzozolus man and so on that uh, are clearly Homo sapiens in terms of the use of tools and so on and when you come down to Cro-Magnon man, 32,000 BC, you don't see a great deal of progression except perhaps the art that you find in the Lascaux Caves. But then in a mere 25,000 years after that, 7,000 BC in ancient Sumer, you've got grid pattern cities, you've got magnificent statuary, you've got architecture, you've got uh, mathematics, philosophy, science, something happened in that period. Uh, now, uh, Theodosius Dobshansky and his Mankind Emerging points out that it looks almost as though Homo sapiens appeared and then disappeared as Neanderthal became sapient and then suddenly reappeared again at the time of Cro-Magnon Man with all kinds of capacities it didn't have before. And the question is, what happened there? That's where the I think the tension needs to be concentrated, not back at the time of Lucy. Um, it, it struck me as I was watching the distribution of cranial size, I mean, I should say brain sizes, apparent uh, cranial cavity sizes, I should say. Um, it would be instructive if on the same plot, uh, a vector was plotted with each data point uh, um, describing the direction of the vestibular canal orientation. It would be very interesting to see which of all of those are pointing this way and which are pointing this way. Very simple. A simple, very clear, distinctive, descriptive uh, diagnostic uh, that would settle all these arguments. I don't understand why people haven't thought of it before. Oh, because it wouldn't settle all the arguments. Why would it not? Because the arguments aren't fueled by data. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Homo sapiens have been, according to these folk, have been here for how many thousands of years? So is there another species coming into play that these folk have discovered? Well, of course there is. It's Aryan man, you know, tall, blonde. <coughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have a theory. I think Monsanto and DuPont and the... Uh, fast food restaurant chains are giving rise to the next. <laughs> I'll make one other comment about uh, errors that creation make, creationists make. <clears throat> In the 1980s, early 1980s, Gallup poll came out with uh, this astounding figure that they've repeated so many times that, you know, not, not that many people in uh, adults in the United States believe in uh, evolution or in science, you know, that God, you know, that uh, man developed by himself and so Is on. Is that like 9% or something like that? It, it, well, it's 9 to 13%, but it's, it's Depends very on small. <clears throat> this shocked the geological community 
And so at the Geological Society of America meetings, national meeting in New Orleans, then they had two symposia on this issue of creation and uh, evolution, per se. And uh, among some of the luminaries was Barghorn uh, from Oregon State uh, and the Len Margolis. Uh, you know, these are icons of uh, the biological world. And uh, they came forth with an impressive list of errors that creationists had made. And uh, some of them were correct and some of them were not. But uh, enough of them were valid that I felt, I was there, you know, I, I felt very uh, humble at that time and I think we need to keep that in mind. Especially, I think, in the, the early or the middle part of um, the last century, uh, we did make uh, a number of errors and we ought to keep that in mind. Now, I uh, want to remind you that uh, you can find a whole lot of errors uh, that evolutionists have made. Oh, but that is covered by the progress of science. Okay, but keep in mind, pri science prides itself on being able to revise itself. The problem is that there's a lot of data that they are, a lot of conclusions they have not revised that they need to revise. Uh, so, uh, but that in that issue, let's keep in mind that we have made errors at times. Uh, and, but truth is above that, and in our uh, context of truth and so on, I think we, we did, uh, our search is an honest search for truth. And uh, we need to uh, approach it from that standpoint. Uh, a lot of errors have been made on both sides. It's, it's yeah. not hard to find these. Uh, I do think that, in general, the creation community as a whole is doing much better now than it was doing 20, 30 years ago. I uh, think so. And I think part of it is they have better data now to make their arguments with. And so they, they realize the importance of being careful, I think, more than, than they used to. And I, I think this, is, this brings up a really important point, which unless somebody else has burning comments, I think I'll end on. And that is, what do you do when you make a mistake like this? I think the thing to do is to say, oops, this is what I did. It's wrong. Uh, what I would like to say is this instead. Um, and, uh, you know, and then uh, let it go at that. And if somebody wants to drag it around and shake it into the mud some, some more, at a certain point, uh, people will go, why are you bringing that up? He's already admitted it. Um, and, and of course, the reason they're bringing it up is very simple. It's to destroy your credibility because you made a mistake, you know. Um, whereas, you know, scientists make mistakes all the time and they just simply quietly abandon them. This is why it's so important that we measure three times and cut once. In other words, before publishing, make sure that all the sources are thoroughly verified that all the data that we're actually citing has been actually confirmed uh, and that, that we know exactly what we're talking about otherwise what's the point of publishing it which get, makes one more point if you're ever asked to peer review a creationist article please give it the really rough treatment because it <laughs> is so much better for you to do it than for some evolutionary guy to, to do it afterwards. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, Collins, Collins has been quieter about junk DNA after. Yeah, so, y you know, all of us 
wind up eating our words. Uh, one of the things that I would say is make your words as sweet as possible so that when you eat them, you don't get de indigestion. <laughs> well, with that, we'll invite you back next week. Um, <clears throat> and you can give the title of your work now. Yes, did, did you share it? Yes, uh, I did. But uh, I'm temporarily blanking on the title. Oh, okay. <laughs> the title of next week's discussion is In Praise of Weakness.